First up is the Maragon Potion. This potion is extremely hidden, only obtainable by using Detect Thoughts on a certain Maragon. This potion causes Befuddled, making the target unable to control its actions, and wanders around without direction. This handy potion is obtained from the hoarding Maragon in the Gauntlet of Shar. To get this, you'll need to talk to your gear and convince him to let you help him complete his contract with Raphael. Once they are neutral towards you, you'll find the hoarding Maragon sitting by the fire near the entrance of the room. While you have Detect Thoughts, on, you'll have the dialogue option to discover that he is the one responsible for charming the displacer beast for your gear. And you can respond by telling him that you were sent to take over for him, and he'll give you the potions that he's been using on the displacer beast, which are the Maragon potions. You can also trade with the hoarding Maragon too, and he has some decent potions and scrolls. I consider this very hidden since there's really no prompt to use detect thoughts on this particular Maragon, which makes me wonder if there are other things hidden behind detect thoughts that haven't been found yet. Are there any other secret things you found through Detect Thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. And next up is Bernard in Act 3. That's right, the automaton you encounter in the Arcane Tower is back. Unfortunately for our metallic friend or foe, he is dead, either by your hands or by one of Kethrick's drow recruits. In the Steel Watch Foundry, there is a table with an automaton component. When interacted with, the narrator confirms it's from the Arcane Tower and the note beside it is from Kethrick, giving it to Gortash as a gift because he thought he might like it since it has gears and whatnot. If you inspect the component, you can further confirm it was from the Arcane Tower because of the two sets of initials embossed in the copper, LDH and YTS. Undoubtedly, these are the initials of Lenore de Hurst and Yuri the Sparkstruck, the lovers who once occupied the Arcane Tower but whose relationship had a very tragic end. And if you like that hidden interaction, don't forget forget to click like and subscribe. Thank you so much. And next up is how to poison the Dwergar. When you arrive in the Grimforge, directly east of the waypoint, you'll find two Dwergar tormenting a deep gnome. They'll repeatedly heckle him, demanding more and more ale. And just like we did to the goblin camp, we can actually go to their cask of ale and poison it. Right near the base of the stairs is the stained cask where the deep gnome is fetching their ale from. Click on it and you can add poison to it. Then the next time the deep gnome does his rounds for the Dwergar, they will instantly die from the poison. And immediately after, the Deep Gnome will begin dialogue with you, thanking you graciously for giving him freedom by giving you a poison of his own, some wyvern poison, which actually makes you wonder why he didn't just poison the cask himself. Shadowheart even mentions earlier that if she was him, she would totally just poison their drink. And next up is cleric deity symbols appearing when they cast certain spells. This is a really neat effect that adds some really awesome flavor to the clerics. Channel divinity spells like Turn Undead will show the cleric's deity before the spellcast is confirmed, and spells like Death Ward, Beacon of Hope, Warding Bond, Spirit Guardians, and more all show the cleric's deity symbol. Shadowheart's Shar animation is special in particular because it's exclusive to Shadowheart. Clerics can't choose the Lady of Loss as a deity, and some of the deities have some really cool symbols, so something to think about when making a cleric is that you're going to have that symbol showing up when you start casting your spells, which I think is really cool. And next up is the Unseen Menace. This is a rare two-handed pike which has some hidden properties you might not notice unless you looked very closely. This weapon has increased critical strike chance from the invisible weapon feature. This paired with the fact that you cannot be disarmed while wielding it, and it gives you permanent advantage on all your attacks, unless you miss an attack. And this weapon is really just packed with incredible bonuses. And if you really want to make sure you don't miss, you can just drink an elixir of hill giant strength, which you should have plenty of by now. And not only does the weapon have a lot of intrinsic bonuses, but it also synergizes well with a number of feats. Despite Polearm Master not listening, listing pikes as eligible to benefit from the feat, Polearm Master does work with all pikes, which includes the Unseen Menace. It's also kind of cool that it's called the Unseen Menace because it's not listed under Polearm Master, so that's kind of cool. It also works with Great Weapon Master since it's a two-handed weapon, and it is actually the only Great Weapon Master weapon that improves your critical strike chance and grants advantage on all attacks. Of course, the minus five to attack rolls from Great Weapon Master can cause some concern considering if you 
you miss, you lose the advantages of the Unseen Menace, but with 20 plus strength, your chances are pretty low of missing. The weapon also has the rush attack weapon action, which is great for closing the gap between you and your enemies. All these bonuses easily make this the best pike in the game, but this two-hander also does piercing damage, which makes it not only the best pike in the game, but also the best two-handed weapon that does piercing damage in the game. If you want to combine this with ballast armor for that vulnerability so that your piercing damage does double damage against those vulnerable targets. And you can purchase the Unseen Menace off Ajak near Jira in Crash Yellick. And next up is a strange interaction with Counter Charm. Counter Charm is an action available to bards at level 6. It creates an invulnerable charm which grants advantage to saving throws against being charmed or frightened. This Counter Charm, when inspected, also appears to be a human bard with 10 AC and is invulnerable. And what's really beneficial about this Counter Charm is that your enemies will actually sometimes attack it, sometimes a lot, absorbing potentially a ton of damage for your party since it's invulnerable. Now this is probably not intended, why are enemies attacking an invulnerable? Vulnerable target, but nonetheless, it can be a very handy, although somewhat unreliable, way to soak some damage for your party. And next up is the Spell Savant Amulet. This amulet grants an additional level 2 spell slot. Previously, you could unequip and re-equip this amulet to receive essentially a never-ending amount of level 2 spell slots, but it was patched and now you can only use the one. The amulet even gets a depleted condition to its tooltip to denote that there are no more spell slots for it to provide. But there is a way to get even more. By passing the amulet to a new character, you get yet another spell slot, and you can do this from character to character to stretch the value of this amulet if you really wanted to. But it is limited to one extra spell slot per character per long rest. This might be something that you want to leave at camp and pass between hirelings if you want to get some value out of them. You can find the Spell Savant Amulet in the High Security Vault number one inside the Counting House in Act 3. And next up is Winter's Clutches. These gloves allow the wearer to inflict two turns of Encrusted with Frost whenever dealing cold damage. However, these gloves had a major drawback. You could only apply Encrusted with Frost on one target per turn. But in patch 6, that limitation has been removed. You can now apply it on area of effect spells such as Ice Storm, Cone of Cold, and Ice Knife. Unfortunately, it does not work with spells like Hunger of Hadar. That would be amazing. But this change also means that attacks that deal more multiple instances of frost damage can now apply multiple turns of encrusted with frost. For example, if you use the Drake Throat Glaive to imbue a weapon to deal cold damage, and you also use Divine Strike Cold with that same enchanted weapon, you'll get multiple turns of encrusted with frost in a single attack. Combine this with extra attack and improved extra attack, and you can freeze enemies very quickly. Of course, once your target reaches seven turns of encrusted with frost, they become frozen, which incapacitates them and makes them vulnerable to bludgeoning, thunder, and force damage. Once they take one of those damage types, the ice shatters and the condition ends. I think it's a pretty cool interaction, and maybe there's a cold damage build out there that's really strong after this change. And next up is the Reposition Malfactor. This weapon action launches a grappling hook to pull your target 30 feet towards you from up to 60 feet away. In the patch 6 notes, Larian states that it will now always succeed and deal no damage when targeting allies, which would be a really useful way to pull teammates out from danger or the threatened condition, but it doesn't appear to be working as intended. It still deals damage to your allies, and your allies can still succeed the saving throw. However, it's still a very cool looking weapon action, and it can be found in the Hellfire Engine Crossbow made within the Steel Watch Foundry in Act 3 by putting together the Steel Watcher Blueprints, Arm, and Targeting Module. And next up is the Grasping Vine. The patch 6 notes described updates to the spell, making it more useful useful in combat, now having better stats and spawning vines when summoned. However, what the notes don't say is that the spell no longer requires concentration and it no longer costs an action. Instead, it costs a bonus action to use, which puts it a little more in line with a spell like Spiritual Weapon, which is a summon for a Cleric. But for some reason, if you decide to upcast the spell, it's back to costing an action, which you definitely wouldn't want to upcast the spell since you gain no benefit from that. The stats have improved as the notes say, and along with that, its health points are now 26, and its attack, Grasping Pull, triggers a dexterity saving throw with a base DC of 8, which is not great, and much like this spell at the cost of a level 4 spell slot, not very great, but an interesting undocumented change from patch 6 nonetheless. And next up is
is Bow of the Banshee. This weapon has a really awesome effect, which makes your targets need to roll a saving throw against becoming frightened each time you hit them with this bow. And you can gain a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and damage against frightened creatures. Now what's really cool about this bonus is that it also applies to your melee attacks too, not just from the bow, which makes this bow have great synergy with other characters that can apply frightened as well, something like a mortal reminder warlock. Also, Frightened is a very strong mechanic, causing those affected by it to be unable to move. You can pair Frightened with two turns of Prone to cause enemies to skip their turns completely, and if you pair Frightened with Blind, you can also make enemies skip their turn. So this bow can be very, very strong when combined with certain conditions and used properly. And it's also a very easy item to miss. The Bow of the Banshee can only be purchased from Corsair Greyman, the Dwergar who intercepts you as you sail towards the Grimforge. If you decide to push him into Ebon lake, then this bow will be lost forever. However, instead, if you cooperate and later find him in the Grim Forge, you can purchase this bow from him for an awesome new source of Frightened. And last, we have a cool interaction with Stench. This action causes the user to have a ghastly fume which nauseates nearby foes. The nauseous condition makes the affected entity unable to take actions, which is very strong, and enemies like the Ghast or the Fallen Gur will have this. But there is a way to decrease your chances of becoming becoming nauseous. As of patch 6, advantage on saving throws against poisoned grants advantage on saving throws against nauseous. So remember to use protection from poison from your cleric, or you can also gain it from dwarven resilience from being a dwarf, or strong heart resilience from being a halfling. You also can actually remove the condition entirely by shutting down the ghastly fume before it ever gets to you. If you can get the target with ghastly fume wet, it actually removes their condition, disabling them from making you nauseous. Nauseous. It kind of makes sense. They smell really bad and you kind of just force them to take a shower, so to speak, and that removes their stench. Makes a lot of sense. And those are 11 more hidden interactions in Baldur's Gate 3. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.